All right, so welcome to our, this is, we're track one here, our 11 o'clock talk is uh, Who Will Rule the Sky? <laughs> we have Matt Cagle and Eric Chen here to give us a nice talk, and please help me welcome Matt and Eric. Here they are. Everyone? Sure. Well, I could stand up. Um, say, hey, everyone, I'm Matt Cagle. I'm a technology and civil liberties policy attorney at the ACLU of Northern California. Um, and today we're here to talk about drones owned by people like you and me, not drones used by law enforcement, but drones owned by normal human beings. Um, there's a ton of really interesting policy issues that private or civilian drone ownership raises, and they're going to be decided by manufacturers, they're going to be decided by policymakers, and they're going to be decided by people who understand code. So um, free expression and privacy are obviously central issues at the core of civilian drone use, and we're going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me, today we're going to talk about those issues through the lens of two pretty interesting case studies. Um, but first, I'm going to hand it off to Eric from DJI. You've got I it. I don't mind. have to hand anything off. Uh, hi, guys. My name is Eric Chang. I'm director of aerial imaging at DJI. Uh, how many of you actually, how many of you have seen a phantom in the air? Yeah? Okay. S slow clap. That's great. Thanks for that. Um, how many of you have flown a phantom? That's a pretty big percentage. Okay, so everybody look under your seats right now. <laughs> no, 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 don't. No. <laughs> I was just kidding, just kidding. Yeah. I was told not to fly this on the way in, so there will not be any fun stuff unless we can get away with it later. Um, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, anyway, the, so, so DJI has been manufacturing phantoms and other aerial imaging products for quite some time, but over the past, say, two and a half years, there's been obviously a huge explosion in the number out there. And if you do a search on YouTube or something, you'll find several million videos of people doing great things and not so great things with them. And that's, uh, that leads to discussions like this. So one of the things uh, I did was put together a, sh a short video so, you, so those, those of you who haven't seen these videos uh, yet can see what people are using them from. Uh, not all the footage is mine, some of it is. Uh, and yeah, let's, let's go and, and I do want to mention that if anyone has questions, I'm going to be looking at my Twitter mentions when I get a chance. So if folks have questions and we don't get the questions at the end, potentially, um, so just tweet them at me and we'll try to get to some of them during the talk. But here's the video.
Okay, so <clears throat> that was an awesome video. Thanks for putting that together. Um, so we're here today again. I want to emphasize to talk about the civilian use of drones. Oh yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Great editing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> how I encounter drones as an ACLU attorney is predominantly in the context of government agencies using drones. As folks are pretty aware probably, um, federal funding is allowing law enforcement to purchase any number of surveillance technologies. Drones are one of these toys and technologies that police departments want to get their hands on as well. And, um, but when it comes to the civilian context, it's different. Um, there are privacy and free speech issues that the use of drones by all of us raise, and there are a separate set of issues. Um, and so today's talk overlaps with those somewhat, but it's really about um, drones used by people like you and me to look at police protests, to take footage of whatever things we want to take footage of. Um, and uh, so I'm going to hand it off to Eric now because we need to give a little bit of a framework for like where the law is at on this right now. Um, as folks know, the FAA has primary jurisdiction at the federal level over drones and there's been some recent movement on that and things are kind of in flux both for the commercial space and also for hobbyists. Uh, yeah, so right now we have a, proposed, a set of proposed rules that are, have not been finalized and those, those govern commercial usage. So what we're here to talk about mostly is non-commercial usage of drones, both how people are using them today and how they might use them going forward. So according, I mean, uh, if you look up here, there's uh, basically there are model aircraft guidelines that were issued in 1981. Uh, and then there was also an FAA um, uh, Reform Act in 2012. And these basically carve spaces out for model uh, aircraft hobbyists to operate in a space outside of FAA jurisdiction. So there are a set of these categories and rules that you have to follow. So that would be less than 55 pounds with, you know, not close to an airport, either three miles or five miles, depending on which, depending on what you've read. Um, and if you're closer, you have to notify the tower and of course sets of uh, safety guidelines. So all of these things, if you follow, end up putting you in a category that is outside of what an unmanned aircraft might be uh, uh, the regulations that would apply to an unmanned aircraft by the FAA. So, and, and being a little bit vague and talking around this stuff because that's of course what the FAA says and there was a big comment period uh, that was just last year. Um, and uh, I don't know, do you have more <laughs> from a legal standpoint about this? Yeah, I mean it's really interesting that the FAA went forward with these rules for commercial drone use and then they specifically, because of the law that Congress passed, specifically carved out this space for hobbyist drones and, and it told the FAA, you know, you should tread lightly in this space right now. And so there's really kind of a vacuum when it comes to rules that, um, be besides these general criteria and guidelines that the FAA has put out there, um, an extension of their previous model airplane kind of rules, um, there's kind of a vacuum as to like where the FAA is moving right, right now. Um, could you tell, I was curious, Eric, we talked about the other day, you said that there's kind of like a gap in the rules, at least when it comes to like different designations of drones and how that might kind of play out. Yeah, what, what we're seeing in the U.S. right now is one giant category, which is between zero to 55 pounds. Now, obviously, the kinds of products that are within zero to 55 pounds are huge. I mean, you can literally buy a remote-controlled paper airplane right now, uh, which would be close to zero, uh, and that would be in the same category. So we're seeing a lot of, um, well, some momentum around potentially a micro-drones category, which would be two kilograms and under, and this matches what a lot of countries uh, who have already figured this out have done, which is categorized by basically by kinetic energy, you know, you know the, how, how much damage can this thing cause. If it's small and fast, it can cause damage, and if it's big and slow, it can also cause, uh, cause damage. And, um, and what you're seeing here on the right is what, what can I do with my model aircraft? Uh, this is part of a new uh, publicity campaign called No Before You Fly by FAA uh, and, and some others. And, and, and this is kind of the state of education right now. You know, you, you, you get this thing in a box maybe if you buy a product, maybe you don't get it. Um, but we're, we're largely left to figure out by ourselves uh, what is okay and what is not because the information is not uh, ingrained in us yet because it's such a new technology. So it's a pretty interesting space. Now the other thing that complicates things is that these products, the consumer products that companies like DJI are making, are actually the same products that are being used commercially. You know, so it's very hard to just draw an arbitrary line around commercialism uh, and, and have rules on one that don't apply to the other. So I think it's going to be a really interesting space going forward. 
Yeah, and, and in the meantime, while these rules are still pending, at least for the commercial space, the FAA has started issuing certificates of authorization and exemptions, um, which they're authorized to do to the commercial space. But again, the hobbyist space is relying on a smaller set of uh, criteria and guidelines that aren't um, going through a formal rulemaking process right now. So one interesting thing that is kind of missing from the FAA's rules and regulations that they're going forward with right now is uh, guidelines for privacy um, and guidelines for um, addressing privacy issues and free speech issues really. So they're very focused on safety, getting drones into the sky in a way that they see fit. Um, but as the FAA waits, states are really moving forward with their own legislation. <clears throat> this is just kind of a chart I pulled together, uh, only part of the chart that starts to canvas the sorts of laws that states are proposing and passing that apply to the private drone use, uh, drone use by people like you and me. There's a whole other slew of laws that states are passing that govern and, and limit the government's use of drones, but there's a ton of bills and a ton of laws now, quite a few laws that um, govern things like peeping Tom statutes, uh, criminal trespass laws are being extended into the drone space, and states are looking at where are the privacy harms and where do we need to act. Um, and while there are absolutely legitimate areas where states should be acting in this space, there are also a, there are also a few very interesting examples of laws that are just being drafted in a very broad sense. So. Uh, at the top there is actually a, a provision that is now law in Idaho, and this, this, this provision actually says you may not use a drone to photograph somebody without their written consent if your purpose is to publish or otherwise disseminate that photo. So that's pretty broad language, and it's not really cabined elsewhere in the statute. Um, that language could be read to uh, limit your ability to take uh, photos of police officers during a protest with a drone if you are part of the news media, for instance. Uh, that language could also be read to limit my ability to take the SD card out of my drone and to take the photo and to send it out over Instagram, for instance. Uh, that would be dissemination. Um, another interesting area, just as a sidebar, um, states are passing a lot of drone laws that relate to hunting. Um, there are at least, I think, half a dozen laws that prevent using a drone to hunt for game or fish. So apparently people are either trying that or hunters are concerned that's, that that sort of thing is going to happen. Um, but that is... A, 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 sorry, that would be to document hunting, right? Um, not necessarily to look for... Not necessarily to put guns... Well, people put guns on their drones these days, but I think it's also to do scouting for, for game and fish. Um, and so I think about half a dozen states have passed laws or proposed bills that would govern that sort of activity. Um, there's also some laws that actually prevent... Uh, surveillance of hunters while they're hunting. Um, I think there's about two bills that are on the table to, that prevent and, and prohibit one from using a drone to surveil a hunter while they're in the process of hunting. Again, those raise interesting questions and uh, that might be triggered by animal rights activists or fear that animal rights activists are going to use drones, for instance, to monitor uh, hunting patterns and people who are hunting. Um, here's another uh, interesting thing. Uh, on the left, you see a story from last week. A federal judge in Idaho struck down this, this uh, law that's called an ag-gag law. You might have heard about these laws. They've been passed pretty recently in a, lot of, in a handful of American states, and they limit um, photography of uh, commercial agricultural facilities. So this includes um, like poultry farms, uh, places where cows are raised and stuff. Um, well, a federal judge last week said that if you, that, that, that sort of law violated the First Amendment because it specifically carved out a type of speech and a type of content and said that it could not be recorded. Well, what's interesting is just a few months ago, the state of Louisiana on the right passed a law that prohibits, uh, it gets at this in a different way. It requires if you want to use a drone to film one of these facilities, you need to get a license from the state. Um, and it has a few conditions. I think the drone footage will actually be owned by the commercial agricultural facility once you take it, even if you have a license. Um, and this is just very interesting because licensing regimes and having to ask the government for permission to speak kind of raises the eyebrows of First Amendment advocates. Um, I, 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 mean, I think what's been really interesting too is that the, the, there, 
the, the, the bills being proposed are, are actually about drones. They're not about the application of drones or drones just being cameras that can be in space. You know, so I, I think you know, we've seen some application of existing law, like tort law around privacy, uh, being applied to drones. And, and, and when that happens, you know, we're, we're sort of a, almost okay. Like I, I feel like that's a perfectly good use of an existing law. But there's a lot of reactive uh, rulemaking happening. Yeah, I do want to emphasize that there are there are a few laws being passed and bills being proposed that are addressing the real privacy harms and and privacy harms things like trespass with drones and where there were gaps in the laws and that's absolutely legitimate to address real privacy harms and places where your current laws are actually not addressing those harms. What I'm focusing on here, what we're focusing on here, are interesting kind of sectorial use of legislation to get at the drone question. And as you can see, lawmakers are still really figuring it. Out. Um, here's one more interesting one that is um, might remind people of a story from last week. So this is a law or a bill that's currently pending in California that prohibits flying a drone over a state jail or prison. Uh, and then as folks may have heard last week in Ohio, there was a story about a drone that was strapped with like three pounds of marijuana, or three ounces of marijuana, some heroin, and some tobacco, and it dropped it over the prison, and then a prison fight ensued. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that was a real thing last week. And, and months before that even happened in Ohio, uh, the California legislator was thinking about a way that that might happen and trying to write a bill that would address that issue. Uh, originally, this bill also prohibited photography of state prisons or jails. Um, the ACLU and a few other advocates raised some concerns, and luckily that has been amended out of the bill. Um, so uh, that's, to, that's all to say that the privacy concerns are not new. Uh, uh, privacy issues related to flight overhead are not new, and policymakers, um, coders, and um, legislators, or, or excuse me, judges, have had to address these questions before. This is actually from uh, a case in the early in the 1930s where a homeowner sued United Airlines and Pacific Air Transport because uh, planes were flying overhead. And the court in that case had to figure out, like, where do we draw the lines um, with this new technology that's flying overhead? Is it, does it make sense to allow the, the homeowner to sue for trespass? because somebody's flying overhead. And so the lines have been adjusted before, and right now we're in a moment where the courts are, and the courts and, the, and lawmakers and all these entities are figuring out where the lines should be today. So anyways, that brings us to the case of a Kentucky man. Um, Eric, you can talk about this Kentucky man if you want. Uh, yes, yeah, so somebody in Kentucky shot a drone out of the sky using a shotgun uh, because he said it was flying over, he said he was flying 10 feet over his property uh, and taking pictures of his daughter, something like it, that was basically his, yeah, yeah. his uh, what he'd said. And of course, the media went nuts with this, and that was the story. Um, and and this has happened uh, a few times in the past. We've seen people shooting drones out of the air, um, and, it, and it leads to a lot of interesting um, discussions. Yeah. So this guy was charged with criminal mischief, I believe, and wanton endangerment. And he, um, he claims that the drone was, I think, flying 10 feet over the ground and that it was taking pictures of his daughter and that it had been over his property or some other sort of drone had been over his property, I think, multiple times. Um, and he, you know, he's, he's, he thinks like his privacy rights were violated because his drone was flying over his property. Um, and the law here is really like unsettled right now. Um, as far as trespass goes, like trespass law in Kentucky only you know makes it a trespass if you go onto the property of somebody else. Um, whether the drone at 10 feet or 200 feet was on his property, that's a question that the courts have been grappling with for a while, and then they've drawn different lines, but not really in the drone context yet. Sometimes folks will say like that sort of thing is a nuisance, and it's possible that if that drone had flown over his property of, like constantly and had interfered with his enjoyment of the land, that there maybe a nuisance like tort claim there, but even that is kind of an untested space right now. Um, whether or not he can shoot that drone at all, uh, I think the answer is probably 
going to fall on the side of, no, you cannot shoot a drone because it's flying over your property unless that drone is threatening your life or your safety and you really think it is. Um, I think in the same way that you can't burn your neighbor's car to the ground when they, dr they park in your driveway, um, just because they parked it there, like that doesn't really make sense. That same sort of like, does this make sense? Is this reasonable uh, thinking is going to probably be applied to this space of drones. But currently, because there's no like laws that go one way or the other clearly, and because he shot the drone, he's been charged with some crimes, some very kind of broad crimes, criminal mischief under Kentucky law. Yeah, and there are a couple issues I wanted to bring up. One is whether a drone is an aircraft. And, and this has been something that I think was decided in, in court in November like by some parties are saying, yes, it is an aircraft. So you know, you, you're not allowed to shoot at aircraft as far as I know. And, um, and so potentially you, know, you wouldn't be able to, allowed to shoot at a drone and those, those same parties, you know, FAA, NTSB, would probably want to get engaged if someone shot at a drone but we're, you know, we're hearing actually maybe they don't want to be engaged. So a lot of people are kind of calling these that classifi classification into question, you know, is it an aircraft or is it not, or is it this third thing that doesn't exist yet? And, and will the NTSB show up when this drone crashes and gets shot down because there's been an air accident, or is it up to the states to, to decide, like, how the law should intervene when this sort of, like, conflict occurs? Right now, states are either, you know, ad hoc, finding ways to address these issues, or they're proposing and passing laws that would actually, you know, try to address them. And there's going to be conflicts going forward. I'm not sure we know what the NTSB right. really is going to do yet in this space. Right. I, I don't, at least. Um, so one interesting thing is, like, how, how will we know what actually happened here? This is a visual flight record that the operator of that Kentucky drone produced uh, from his iPad after the drone went down. So I'm interested, Eric, in wondering, like, I, I want to know, like, how do we know in these situations, like, how do we resolve conflicts? How do we know what happened, what's being collected, that sort of thing? Uh-oh, convergence. Oh, hey. Hello. <laughs> how are you? Very yeah. good. Well, you can shake my hand, too, but I need the microphone. <laughs> so um, we have a tradition, about a 12-hour-old tradition. With uh, new speakers for DEF CON, we invite them to partake in a little bit of a beverage. Hurry up, Paul. Will you let them talk about drones, which is really fucking cool? Go ahead. Drones are really fucking cool. All right. We, we, we can keep going? <laughs> we can keep going. Okay. We'll keep going while it's being poured. Um, so, so this is really interesting. So the guy who flew the drone then produced his flight log. And, um, and we're going to talk about logging and, and what that means in this space in a second. And, and he showed his flight, you know, what he said was his flight over it, and that perhaps he had never been under, you know, 193 feet and never stopped over the property. Um, and he was able to show exactly when he flew over the property and for how long. And, and so now, of course, well, of course, since the media already had the original story, nobody knows that. Um, but this is the sort of thing that could be used as evidence, you know, to show that maybe he, he didn't do what the guy said. Yeah, and, and the fact that it was 200 feet over the ground potentially rather than just 10 feet over the ground might actually play into any sort of claim he would have that there was like a trespass happening because courts, well, this is more interesting than courts. <laughs> Are these guys doing a good job? Oh wait, somebody needs to get the drone a shot. Uh, I think that is the loudest cheer for uh, uh, Shot the Noob that I've heard all weekend. So good, good job guys. Yeah, wow, all right, so there you go gentlemen. You know how this works. Uh, to all the new attendees, to the new speakers, welcome to DEF CON. For the record, I just tried to shoot the mic. <laughs> I went. I'll be sure to wipe it off. <laughs> All right. So at least in like if it, <laughs> oh no, if the operator wanted, sorry, if the gentleman wanted to sh to sue for trespass, it might matter that there is actually evidence showing where exactly that drone was in the sky, not ge not just geographically, but like the altitude it was at. And this is a more detailed version yeah, of that, Yeah, so I wanted right? to show really quickly um, what exactly gets logged. And um, this is, of course, from the perspective of DJI, and I can talk about the greater industry as well. Um, but we have flight logs uh, in part because users 
like gamification. You know, they want to see their flights. They want to be able to go back and refer to uh, what you know where they've been flying. This one on the right is a flight that I did not too long ago um, in Italy, and it shows you know this flight path along with where I took pictures, um, and it stores things like. It also stores your stick movements, which is very interesting. So. You know, we're motivated to, to store flight logs not only because users have asked for this feature, but also because when someone, when someone says they had a flyaway or they, the drone malfunctioned, we can take the log data if they submitted to us and look at it and actually see where their sticks were. They, we can see exactly what they did during flight to determine whether they did something or whether we did something. And if it was something that we did, then we'll fix it. But if it's something that they did, they have to fix it. So I'm curious here, though, like where do the logs live, and like what level of detail is there? So as like a privacy attorney, I often wonder like where can governments go and where can civil litigants go if there's a dispute and someone, you know, government wants to put somebody in jail for doing something. Like who do they demand this information from, and what can they get from the drone owner, and what can they get from right. DJI? Yeah. So on on our side, we have two kinds of logging. We have black box logging on board, which lives in the memory on the flight controller, and that logs. At pretty much everything. So, you know, all the inputs in the system, you know, including, you know, I don't know, voltages to DSCs, RPMs of motors, um, battery cell monitoring, that sort of thing. We do not transfer those back to the app in real time. What you get here is essentially where you were. So, GPS coordinates, which is, I know, sensitive information, uh, altitude, and uh, what the user was doing with the sticks, for example. Um, and we have a cloud sync service, so you can push it up to the cloud if you'd like, uh, which is opt in. Uh, and, and, but I think all of these issues are, are new, new right, for this right. industry, certainly, for essentially consumer ele electronics and toys. Do we want to do questions now or at the end? Because um, we had one here. Sure, we'll take one real quick. Oh yeah, so verification. So we, we have not put that much energy in, into that. Oh, the question was about uh, whether you can verify that this data is accurate and whether it's forged. And, um, and, and so the answer is, you know, since we, we essentially are from going from consumer electronics, basically toys, into something that's much more useful, those are all still open questions. And what you see in, in traditional photography, for example, is that for example, Canon will release a product that allows you to sign images to, to prove that they're authentic, but their normal cameras, even their professional cameras, do not have those features. So you're, you're allowed to go monkey with the data if you want. Now, in, in other companies, say like uh, open source products, um, you have full access to the logs, and the full logs are often transferred to the, to the radio, and because that's totally open, there's really no attempt to even encrypt it. You know, so I, I think we're, it's, it's, we're in a stage where you can find data that's completely open, not protected, um, and then you can find company, companies like DJI who are doing things um, as, as they become more and more important you know, due to numbers being in the population. And then, of course, some just don't log at all. So uh, on this topic, some governments are actually trying to address this issue of you know, privacy and uh, the ability to shoot drones. This is an ordinance that was put forward in a small Colorado town last year, or earlier this year actually, um, and that it, it grants the right to engage, quote, engage a drone or aerial vehicle if it's coming onto your property. It reads a little bit like a, like a day out of a Tea Partier's diary, but the FDA, the FAA took this really seriously. Um, the FAA, I think, issued some statements that said, you know, shooting drones is not you know, okay because you can't shoot aircraft. Um, this, this ordinance has not moved forward. There was actually another bill in Oklahoma this year that would allow uh, property owners to shoot drones just the same. That bill is also dead now. Um, so just, just, just to say, like, yet again, there's a gap in the law. There's a gap in where the policy is. And states and localities are trying to fill that gap with their own proposals. There's actually one that offered uh, cash, too, if you shot one down. Right, right. Question. How's it going? I'm actually from Oklahoma, and uh, I am a 333 exempt. I have 333 exempt status. Um, the question is really to the attorney: If we have a, a DJI Matrice, for example, and we're flying it in an engagement for commercial use, it does have an FN number of the FAA. How would how would the FAA um, classify that that drone? It would it be considered an aircraft at that point, and how would they classify other aircraft that are shot at? So your question was if you take a drone that is certified for commercial uses and you fly it for non-commercial uses? Yeah. 
D- during, yeah. During a commercial engagement, if somebody was to shoot at our drone that is classified with the FA with an FN number, tail number, all that stuff, and you mentioned earlier that they're not really classifying, that nobody really knows if they're classified as aircraft or not, if it is classified with them as an aircraft, what is the law state about shooting an aircraft that is, uh, besides drones, I'm sorry, I'm confusing, um, if somebody was to shoot at an airplane, what would happen to them? Right, I mean, I'm not super aware of the drone shooting law precedent that might, it actually doesn't exist. Um, so I, the, the current regulations, I know the FAA regulations, they don't actually provide for what would happen if one shoots at a drone specifically, but uh, my understanding is that current FAA, long-standing FAA rules are going to you know, apply in that sort of situation if one endangers an aircraft or something like that, but I, can't, I haven't seen this actually be adjudicated. The FAA has gone after folks joyriding with their drones and there's been case you know, case law created around that, but there hasn't been, as far as I'm aware, a specific like dispute that uh, someone has decided in that context. Eric, do you have more on that? Like, I think we can assume that like it's not going to be okay, and the FAA is going to find a way to make it not against you know not under the law. They're going to say it's illegal if someone does that. Um, Another question? Sure. I was just curious um, when you're seeing these policies being created, are you seeing more? Um, on the end of the um, the privacy side, or are you seeing them more um, towards the rights of the drone operators? Seen it more on the privacy side, actually, and and so I haven't we haven't really focused on the many bills out there that are kind of extending traditional privacy law into this space. There's a there's a, there's multiple bills that are saying you can't be a peeping tom, but with a drone, you can't you know trespass onto somebody's property, but with a drone. What we're focusing on are those bills that are kind of getting at privacy issues or just just sectors of the economy um, with often a privacy interest in the mix, but they're sweeping in a different direction a lot of the time. Um, so this brings us to our, our next case study. This is from January of this year. Eric, do you wanna, wanna chat about this? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I want to, but I will. Uh, a, uh, a, a phantom, I think it was a, uh, an original phantom, uh, ended up on the White House lawn. And uh, this obviously caused um, a huge uproar. And um, I think what, what, I mean, I, I'm not sure that the details are actually that clear, but what we understand, what we've been told by media mostly, um, is that a government employee was drunk and flew it out of the, his apartment window, or flew a friend's quadcopter out of the apartment window probably lost contact and then uh, uh, what's going on? Oh, okay, I'll finish the story. Uh, probably lost contact with it and then it decided to go home, wherever home was, and probably lost power on the way and unfortunately ended up uh, on the lawn. So, yes. And, and we have a, a DEF CON first. We have a recreation of that day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Here we go. We could do it with a bigger one. You need another shot first, I think. Where's the lawn, though? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. It's coming in the So that's the White House right there. All right, there. it's down. Okay. Secret Service, go for it. <laughs> right, now, can everybody jump on it? Yeah, everyone jump on it. All right. I'm okay, sorry. thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> Okay, now I can't fly the drone. Okay, can somebody get the drone? Please, please. <laughs> there we go, there we go. Yay, all right. <laughs> um, so, so what was DJI's yeah. response to this? So I think our, there's okay. a lot of like, yeah. unanswered questions. So our, our response, uh, which actually started, so there's the public perception of what happened and then what was going on behind the scenes. So our response was to make pretty much all of DC a no-fly zone. And that caused uh, mostly hobbyists to perhaps not be so happy, but actually that whole area is already a no-fly zone. And um, because it's, it's critical, critical infrastructure, it could probably be classified as that. Um, and it's the, it's the same, those are the same rules that, you know, if you were flying a private aircraft, uh, you would have to abide by. Um, and so that had not made it into DJI's uh, no-fly feature set. So what we had done not long before was make it very difficult to fly uh, near an airport. Not the five miles that FAA had talked about, um, but you know we had some kind of fall off for, for maximum altitude and you're grounded at a certain radius around major airports. 
And it's important to note that these features, this, this, the geofencing, is not necessarily intended to prevent bad actors from doing things. Because it's, it's not, right now, not that difficult to buy another brand, fly without GPS. In the long term, GPS is unlikely to be the, the primary and only form of positioning. You know, there's visual positioning. There are all sorts of things that are being developed now uh, that would serve as redundancy or, you know, alternate methods of, of navigation. So um, these no-fly zones right now were done proactively to really prevent people who maybe didn't know that they shouldn't be flying in, in the middle of DC, for example, um, or close to an airport from doing it on accident. Right, and I think your point about like the restriction you, you've placed or that have been placed on like geofencing in this case, um, there's often uh, you know, talk of DRM on devices people own and making, and, you know, not allowing computers to be general purpose computers. And I think uh, when folks advocate for more restrictions like this, be it on a drone or on a computer that I own or a car that I own, I think it's important to remember, like, and, and this is something that policymakers, especially at the state level, need to be aware of, is that when you're going after the bad actors and you're, you're creating these restrictions in order to get at the bad actors, those folks are exactly the folks who are going to be smart enough to do what they need to do or determined enough to do what they need to do, um, that these restrictions aren't going to matter. So I think it really, it should inform, it should, con it should continue to inform like the way these sorts of um, restrictions are talked about and debated at both the company level and at the policymaker level. Um, one thing that's really interesting I think is that there's often like this talk of like I won't know who the drone who owns the drone that's right outside my window I won't know whose drone landed in the White House lawn like what sort of methods of attribution are being proposed right now to create that sort of connection what, what's possible what's possible um, so we I mean at, at, DJI specifically requires activation of new product in the same way that an iPhone does, for example. Um, and this is not something that all companies are doing in this space, but I think as companies uh, grow up, they sort of realize that um, you know, we need to do something to help users uh, and to help us you know, uh, uh, to figure out who's, really, who's liable, but to also offer maybe some features that might be useful. Um, and of course, customers can always make the decision about which one to buy. So we have um, activation. That's all, it's tied to an email address, so it's not like it's it's tied to some form of real ID necessarily. Could I use a proxy, um, like you, like web address? You could absolutely use a proxy. You can use anything you want. Um, and um, the other thing that uh, we have is serial number data. So serial number data is loosely connected to how it was sold. You know, so we don't necessarily know who it was unless they registered, but we could we might know what dealer. Uh, what dealer purchased it? Um, I think historically we've gotten a couple. We've gotten a couple requests. We haven't gotten any um, super high-profile ones, um, and have so far been operating, you know, based on subpoena, you know, kind of like a lot of companies do. Right. But as more information, like your newest model, allows for like streaming video into both, you know, into both YouTube, I think, and also into your cloud. So obviously there's going to be in, there's going to be developing questions of whether and how law enforcement can gain access or litigants who want to like sue their neighbor for trespassing. There's going to be questions about what do what sort of content is available too, and what sort of sensitive metadata is available as well. Um, so another thing I had a question about is like, was the initial firmware update mandatory, and are firmware updates man mandatory now, or how did that play out? Yeah, so we had a very, very brief period in which we had a, we had a mandatory firmware update, and but we very quickly made all firmware updates optional. So right now they are they are optional. So if we add something that users don't like, they can choose not to update. And we will be annoying about it and tell you you should probably update. There's a red thing that flashes kind of pretty much constantly, um, but but we don't force people to do it. Now the question is if we if we patch something um, that was a bug, yeah, and the user is like flying a security it now, vulnerability, um, then then who's liable? Are we liable because the user didn't upgrade? Uh, and these are all these are all questions. We're not sure. Yeah. Right now, though, it's voluntary. Right now it's and voluntary. The, the patch would not come unless it, they wouldn't get the patch without the firmware update in complete form, right? Correct, right. Okay. Um, so this is another, you can explain this, Eric. Yeah, this is interesting. So there's a whole um, software economy. We'll get into this later if we have time. But uh, this is a, a screenshot of an app called AirMap, uh, which is, ha has set out to basically map all of these uh, areas that might be a problem for flight. So whether you're flying recreationally or commercially. So you can basically toggle on and off 
you know, airports of different kinds, whether you're operating commercially or as a hobby, um, heliports, you know, these things that might be hard, that you might not actually know about. Um, and so we're seeing some companies grow up around no-fly compliance, safety, um, and it's very likely that we'll start to see a lot more integration between manufacturers who may not want to do this themselves, or, or may, I think some may, um, and companies like this. So, so right now you're sort of, you have to check this yourself and determine whether you can fly there. Um, but going forward, I think there, there could be a lot more integration. Um, and so this is just getting at um, two other sorts of no-fly zones of recent uh, vintage. The one on the left is a letter that the ACLU sent to the FAA last fall during the protests in Ferguson. There was a, an ad hoc no-fly zone was issued by the FAA that prohibited flight around this area over Ferguson. Uh, and the ACLU raised the serious First Amendment concerns with that sort of restriction where it wasn't based on like a compelling need to protect officer safety on the ground. And that no-fly zone would have applied to both aircraft, uh, traditional aircraft, and to drones. There was an interesting t one you told me about last week, uh, Eric, that relates to Burning Man. Yeah, it relates to Burning Man. I, I went last year to do live, uh, live streaming to the Burning Man Ustream channel. And, um, and, and this year, uh, BLM has, has gotten a lot more aggressive about re restricting drone use altogether. So what's happened is they've come to agreement, an agreement with, with ba basically an application process based on merit. So you submit... A, an application to fly a drone at Burning Man, and it could be based on uh, uh, artistic intent or media coverage, or you know they have categories, and there are whole lots of rules, and they're going to issue 30 of them. I think the day it opened, there were, I mean, last I, I think on the first day, someone I know applied, he was on the waiting list as number 400. Mm -hmm. So there's certainly a lot of demand, um, and part of this is because last year there were rules set up and everybody ignored them. So, you know, it's, it's sort of hard. But what, what's, what's interesting is that's a little model of what's going on in the U.S., for example. You have uh, sort of blanket, no commercial operation, and then Section 333 exemptions being granted, and then at this sort of smaller level around Burning Man, you, you see that same thing happening. Right, so you see, you know, both the no-fly zones at the manufacturer level, also at the ad hoc governmental level, and then private groups of people are deciding when and where drones should fly. That's just to say, it's not entirely clear yet where these decisions are going to be made about who can fly drones and where. That, that authority is in flux right now, and it's very interesting that everyone's kind of filling the gaps. Um, there was actually a bill last year, so state legislatures also concerned about infrastructure. There was a bill uh, earlier this year, in fact, that prohibited photography of critical infrastructure in the state of New Jersey. The ACLU raised the First Amendment concerns with this because critical infrastructure under under this bill could mean like really anything, including you know toll booths, um, and it was so vaguely defined that it swept into the rights of people to collect information and to disseminate that information. Um, so states are getting at this from their own angle, but it's not always with regards to like flight restrictions. It might be they're trying to prevent uh, terrorists, uh, quote unquote terrorists, from taking photos of toll booths or bridges or nuclear power plants. And this is all going to get even more interesting because what's happening now is uh, we're starting to see drones become a platform for developers. Uh, that may, might be of particular interest here, um, but there's a there, there's an application layer now uh, that would be basically the same as what you were see, what we saw in the smartphone world. You know, drones will become a platform for vertical, you know, or horizontal applications to be written by third parties. Um, and so some of the first examples we're seeing are. Things like mapping, you know, photogrammetry, kind of standard aerial imaging uh, when data is being used. So, you know, we're seeing 3D mapping and, and 2D mapping and, you know, using all sorts of different kinds of cameras, mostly for agriculture, construction, mining, uh, utility inspection, those sorts of things, um, commercial operations. Um, but we're also seeing some creative tools, uh, things that cinematographers might want. If you wanted a very beautiful flight around your house, uh, there are some apps coming online in the, in, in the next few months that will allow you to preview those flights, to plan and preview them using 3D environments, say using Apple Maps, uh, and then you just play it back and your drone takes off and does that same flight, and it's repeatable. So in that case, if something happens, uh, who, you know, is it, do we just get terms of service, you know, like when you run iTunes, there's a 73 page thing, but you're going to have terms of service for like the, the platform and then the app. They're going to be like, no, that guy's liable, no, yeah, that guy's exactly. liable. Um, and, and then as you have more 
players in this ecosystem, there's going to be a lot more collection of information, and no longer is it just going to be the SD card living on the drone. There's going to be uh, footage being streamed not only to YouTube potentially or DJI's cloud, or you know, also a bunch of apps out there who are collecting information, say for real estate purposes or to survey property. So again, like if you're thinking of like security and where the data is going to be flowing, there's going to be a lot more actors who are going to have touch points to that data, and there's going to be a lot more ways potentially that that data can be compromised and accessed by third parties. So it's interesting, and um, I think we have we can maybe take another question if someone has a question. Yeah, I think there are mics wandering around. Fascinating talk. I want to thank you. So in the early 90s, or maybe mid-90s, in the Northeast, I want to say New York, there was a case where uh, wildlife photographers posted autonomous cameras, you know, the hunt, kind of hunting cameras that are motion activated on private property. The property owner found the cameras, destroyed the cameras. The photographers then went and said, hey, we have every right to photograph these beautiful deer or whatever, and the courts disagreed. Said, no, you put free stuff on someone's property, they have an absolute right to deal with it um, in any manner they so choose. The drone question then, with respect to private property and the uh, photography of private property, and what, regardless of whatever's on it, whether it's your daughter, your deer, or a blade of grass, seems to hinge on is the drone on private property? So the question is, have you seen a revision or a set of cases that look at the revision of property rights definition, meaning air rights definition? How high do my air rights go? Is it 30 feet, 100 feet, or do I have it, like sovereign nations do, into space? Yeah, like we were saying earlier, you know, courts have had to grapple with that before as commercial airliners started flying over people's houses and say you lived in the path of the local airport's, you know, ascent, you know, area. Um, courts have had to move those lines around before. Uh, where the law has shifted, at least in like the trespass sense, is towards like lower to the ground is where your property rights end. But again, drones are different and drones can fly and um, get into pro uh, private property in ways that you know, traditional airplanes and helicopters couldn't. So it wouldn't be a surprise if the courts and policymakers had to readjust those lines again. But right now, again, that's all in flux. It's all in flux. I have seen a lot of discussion about it, but no real proposals for, for how it might change. And mostly, again, in the, it's around commercial use of drones, um, which is, you know, not, cer by cer certainly not close to the, the numbers that are being used in a hobby. Um, so here's an interesting... Um, in fact, I guess, uh, you know, national parks have banned drones. So there's, there's an open question about whether you can take off across the street from a national park and fly into the national park. I mean, they can certainly prevent you from launching from the ground, but they're not sure where, the, where does the airspace start. I think, you know, according to FAA, it's at zero. Like, you don't own any of your airspace. Uh, so these are all things that are in flux, and we hear discussions constantly about them. Are we, are we done? All right, guys. Thanks for having okay. us today. Thanks so much.